it will be really um, important to start with the work that is actually on show here um, at, uh, at here uh, on the first floor. Um, Skip Loop, if you haven't seen it already, I urge you to do so afterwards. Um, a computer generated animation of an undulating landscape. Um, the illusion of natural beauty and continuity of movement collapsing every six seconds when the loop repeats itself. I find this repetition and this glitz of a beautiful seascape to be important as a framing device uh, for our conversation today. So I wanted to ask you, what is the origin of this work, if indeed there is an origin inside it? Uh, yeah, so uh, Skip Loop was, I guess, inspired. Uh, it was it's a work from two thousand and four actually that has been remade. It was remade recently in two thousand and nineteen uh, to, for a for an eight K screen. Um, and the original, uh, when I was making these works that were digital, completely computer generated works uh, back in two thousand and four, I guess this, this is pre NFT, but the you know the sort of form of them, uh, aesthetic form. Uh, was very much what NFTs sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, the sort of primary form for NFTs is. Um, they were sort of ins inspired by uh, Richter actually and, and photorealism. And I was thinking about Richter uh, and photorealism. My interest in photorealism was um, uh, the way that there's a perceptual um, shift that occurs from from sort of uh, seeing an image. To looking at brushstrokes, so that shift from seeing to looking uh, was kind of interesting to me, um, and how that's a perceptual thing, um, and and thinking about, uh, I guess Walter Benjamin in some ways, like the age of mechanical reproduction. What's 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 the artwork in the age of digital reproduction? I guess I was I was thinking about. So I was making these transcriptions of Richter paintings and images, uh, candles for instance, and and, and seascapes. So I got really into his um, uh, uh, land landscape painting, particularly the seascapes. And I'd read a um, uh, something about, there was a st statistical data about how long a person spends in front of a painting at the Louvre, and it was six seconds. So I thought that sort of the attention span is six seconds, so it became this thing of making six second loops. Uh, incidentally, I mean, if, you know, it's, it's it's funny that now there was there's similar statistics with Instagram and how long people spend uh, uh, on images on Instagram and other and other sort of uh, uh, social media or, or, or other technologies, di digital technologies, um, and it was really about those ideas. So perception, you know, how we sort of think about uh, space and time, um, uh, engagement, uh, and this sort of uh, the rendering of the natural world in, and which collapses into sort of the digital world. There's not actually there's another thing maybe uh, this maybe come up later, but uh, a uh, so I, Costas had sent me the questions earlier, so I've made some notes on my phone, and uh, maybe it's something to talk about later because I know you have yeah other questions. Sorry, yeah, okay. Well, uh, of course, and I just wanted to frame again um, this glitch that we see in Skip Loop. If you notice it, um, when you see it upstairs, there's this white foam on top of waves that we're seeing um, in the sea, and it's kind of maybe the telling sign that there is a glitch in, uh, in the work, and it is the moment where, as the viewer, you realize that what is before your eyes might not be what you thought it is, um, and it can be read, of course, highlighting the attention span that you just described um, and our growing demand at the same time in technology and thirst for more content that this, you know, mode of being, seeing, observing, engaging with um, has taken over our lives. But to me, coming also from my work and research in ecology, it is also a comment um, on the fleeting nature of the way that we engage with ecological discourse, um, that um, meaning that the way that we think about the climate crisis is also fleeting. We also are ready for the next piece of information without actually having digested it. And the message hasn't quite sunk in yet that the world that we are living in is already collapsing, maybe beyond repair. 
So in this way, I wanted to open up a conversation even further about how notions of ecology and technology are connected um, and how ecology has always been latent in your work, but perhaps you're engaging with it in new ways. And I just wanted yeah, to tell you, to ask you about how technology and ecology intersect in your work. Yeah, I guess it's a good question. I think there was always a subtext to technology and ecology, um, even with these seascapes that I was making. I was, in, I was obsessed with landscape. But when I say landscape, that could be um, anything from quantum mechanical landscape to you know, you, the universe, right? Um, and not just restricted to uh, the surface of our planet. Um, and I guess, um, um, so there was this, always this subtext, but I guess it really took shape when I started working with solar panels uh, in sort of 2013. I was invited to do a show actually at Villa Savoie, which is um, the Cabuzier house in just outside Paris in Poissy. And uh, because of the restrictions in the house, um, I couldn't plug anything in, right? But my by that point, I was already, you know, the, I guess my medium was electricity. I was working with electrical signals, and, and so I needed to power. I needed power to <laughs> to play with. Um, so I, I I I went to solar, and 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 that was the first time where uh, I guess technology and ecology became a, a, a sort of a latent part of my voca visual vocabulary. Um, I guess, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't, it was a practical means to a sort of uh, physical end, I guess, rather than, rather than uh, overtly thinking about technology or thinking about um, um, uh, uh, ecology, for instance, right? So, um, but as time went on, um, that became like a really integral part of my work and, and sort of, uh, conceptual thinking around, around, mm -hmm. around the work, I guess. Um, can you tell us a little bit if there is a linear timeline or way to describe it in your uh, mind, how technology has evolved through your practice? Um, you, of course, being known for engaging with sound and music. Uh, now that you mentioned electricity, you said that there was a moment that you realized electricity was your medium. Um, and then, of course, leading up to uh, later work, you have engaged with NFTs, uh, you have engaged with the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can walk us through to those steps, if, if they make sense as yeah. a linear progression. I think they do. I think the thing is this the realization that electricity was my medium was very late it wasn't until like um, I don't know 2015 16 maybe even later and I was make oh no that's not correct but anyway I was making yeah I was make I was using electricity as part of my work or you know as a medium since 2000 since I was at Goldsmiths it was actually sort of by chance there was these architects that did a workshop uh, at Goldsmiths and in that workshop there was some stuff that we were supposed to be doing that I was kind of in, but there was also some stuff in my, on my desk that I was messing around with, and I brought the two together, and suddenly there was um, sound being produced from uh, an LED strip, basically, and, and that became a way of composing for me, I guess. I was in, uh, interested in autonomous uh, systems for production of music and reproduction of music at the time. It was a design MA at Goldsmiths. And um, so that sort of emerged from there, um, and, you know, I didn't really think about it in terms of a medium. I just, yeah, I was just, you know, working with it. And, and, and then these solar panels that we see here emerged after this, um, uh, after this, after 2013, when this uh, show at Kabuse House happened. Um, the, and then the ec ecological side is actually what prevented me at, to, from working with NFTs for many years, you know. So even though, you know, you've seen these, all these images, these digital, because after graduating, I didn't have a studio. I was just working from home from a desktop computer. So all my work became digital, actually, for about uh, three years, three or four years. And, um, uh, and then once it became physical again, and I went, I went and did my second master's and so on and so forth started making these kinds of sculptures um it was it was you know the, the form of it was slightly different um so and then when the conversation with 
NFTs emerged, it was super interesting to me, but it was prohibitive in terms of just the environment, the environmental mm -hmm. side of it. So um, I was working with, and I was, you know, just spoke to lots of different NFT platforms, Blank and um, who's the other one? There's another one, uh, Zian and some other, you know, people to do projects. But in the end, the the question, there was two things for me. It was the, it was the uh, sort of the market side of NFTs and the, and the sort of, uh, um, you know, all the, the sort of, yeah, uh, the market side that was was a problem for me, and then also uh, the and then the ecology side. So I project, developed this project with uh, a curator called Charlie, and then the whole plan was to release it with the Ethereum merge. You know, so once proof of stake uh, uh, happened, then with with on the Ethereum network, then that would be the moment to launch it, and. And, but then the conversation sort of died down and there was other things going on and finally uh, we released uh, this Solstice Star project with Verse and uh, that was kind of the first, I guess, entry into uh, into working with NFT because you, it's, it's also a, a challenge to get your head around the, you know, how the network works, the mechanics of it, the technicality, the programming and all kinds of layers of, of, uh, of stuff that comes with um, blockchain um, and uh, but now it's it's a it's a good opportunity to kind of dive back into these early digital works and kind of relook at them in a in a sort of more interesting way just um, now that you mentioned the source those uh, source the star project with verse I wanted to hear a little bit more about it because correct me if I'm wrong this may have coincided with COVID, um, or was it something that was in development before? It, it was, yeah, yeah. It, it was actually, yeah, developed pre-COVID and then it happened. And then launched yeah. during. So I was wondering if we end, can draw a little bit, draw out a little bit, if there is, um, if there is a connection to be made between, um, you know, us being able and being also asked to embrace technology perhaps dive deeper into what NFTs and blockchain mean throughout a time that we're also asked to stay home and be in isolation and the planet really going into a complete different direction that we're expecting. Um, do you think that there is something that we can draw out there in the work that you presented, but also tell us a little bit about Solstice Star in general? Basically, there was this, when I was studying, and this is actually my undergraduate in, in, in Winchester, you know, sort of to, uh, 99, I was really influenced by this book by uh, a, an architect, I guess, it's called Richard Coyne. It was called Techno Romanticism. I don't know if, if, if you've ever, yeah. And um, it's a, not a very well known book. I don't know if anyone's aware of it. It's, it's very like, little known. Um, but it was about, uh, essentially, it was about human transcendence from the physical realm to the digital realm and how that will look and what's the psychological, social, cultural, and economic. Um, you know, cite what, what what that means in, in terms of those things, and um, uh, so I was. But it, but for me, it was also there was also a lot of critique in this. You know, like what is this? What does this mean that we transcend the material realm into the digital realm holistically? Uh, which he talks about. You know, he brings all kinds of things into the argument from Oedipus narratives to kind of I, I don't know, like. Um, Freudian and like just a lot of psychoanalysis and lots of lots of um, Heidegger. He talks about technology. That one of the uh, interesting things actually with technology is this idea that I really love that technology isn't a. It's not a man-made thing that just exists because we will it to. It's 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 a it's it's a species that co-evolves with humans. You know, which is uh, which comes from Heidegger, but it's a kind of a fascinating idea and it gets really interesting when you think about it in terms of the context of AI for instance and 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 what intelligence is what conscious good question of consciousness and so on um, and uh, so that was that that was actually really influential for me and always thinking about this sort of you know what it means to be at home you know and and be plugged in is it is it us that's doing that is it a symbiotic thing with technology mm -hmm. or is it technology that demands us to do that right and this is this goes beyond sort of the ideas of um, a super intelligence or anything like that it's, it's more like a um, yeah it's more to do with nature if, if anything and you know we mustn't forget that 
all of our technologies run on electricity, which is a, a natural phenomenon. You know, the sort of the, the and, and so do we. You know, we have uh, uh, el electrical pulses that uh, activate all parts of our uh, uh, senses, along with uh, biochemistry. Um, and um, and uh, so, yeah. So all these sort of ideas and thinking about ecology, uh, technology, and nature. And ecology sort of sort of collapsed in that um, in that work solstice style. Mm. You know, it was it was originally it was originally um, my gallery had asked me to uh, make a digital work just to just to send to people during during the festive season, um, and 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 I made this object that somehow uh, yeah talks about all these things because for me the festive season is all about the solstice as opposed mm. to uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving or these sort of other uh, things because they, 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 it all comes around to this this moment when there's a switch in terms of uh, mm. um, in terms of the seasons essentially. Yeah to me um, I'm Greek and us Greeks we love etymology and breaking things down so I just wanted <laughs> to do a quick thing because I was inspired by what you said. Uh, when we think about um, the word ecology it comes from Ecos, uh, which means home or house, um, and logic comes from logic or logos, which means to speak or to reason. Same with technology, the second part is the same, and uh, techno comes from the word techni, which means art or craft. So those two things are completely interconnected because ecology is the way that we think about our home or where we make home or the different homes around the world that are part of the same system and how we reason and speak about them. And technology is what kind of craft and what kind of tools are in our hands to speak about these things. And those things are ever evolving and ever changing. So that was also why I think subconsciously I was trying to make a connection between those two in a time of distancing and in a time where everyone was uh, even more engaged with technology uh, in their home. Um, but I wanted to go back to skip loop, um, which is quite interestingly for your practice, uh, silent work. Um, when throughout you pra uh, your work have you have ex explored sound at great lengths. So for me, the silence is uh, also a pause for reflection. It is a chance to maybe step inwards, um, an opportunity for realignment, if you may, and maybe a six second ritual. Mm. So I wanted to ask you, what is the importance of sound, of silence, of ritual in your life and in your practice? Mm. Um, yeah, sound, silence and ritual. Sound and silence. For me, silence and sound, there's never any silence, you know, even in the vacuum of space, you, you know, you would presumably have auditory hallucinations as soon as, you know, within like five or ten minutes. I, uh, there was a, sh there was a work that I made, which is an anechoic chamber with pitch black in, in, in darkness that, um, yeah, for me certainly, and, um, and obviously, and lots of other people, you know, uh, auditory and visual hallucinations happen almost immediately. So, um, si silence, yeah, there's always, there's always sound and, you know, there's, uh, I guess, um, um, John Cage's, you know, 433 is, is, is famous for this idea of silence, but there is the whole situation that's there. And then I guess Max Newhouse, I don't know if it was before or after, but presumably after, uh, did this piece called Listen, where uh, people were uh, stamped the word listen on their hand and just taken out of the chamber and onto a bus and went around New York. Um, so there's no, there's never any silence. And I think, um, for this, yeah, for that six seconds, and it's a choice, you know, there's a choice, you can, you can be there for six seconds, but the, the glitch or the skip, you know, in, in, that, in that work um, demands you to stay somehow because it's kind of uncanny what's happening because the, the ocean continues to move as the ocean mm. would move. I mean, there's a, there's a loop, so it's a, it's a trick, but it's a seamless ocean movement uh, and the only no, the only reason you know there's a there's a loop is because there's uh, some bubbles that sort of jump right, and um, uh, so that itself is that is is this uh, where reality somehow collapses that thing about perception again and, and what you're looking at is it is it a film is it a rendering is it you know 
um, what's the length of this thing, why is it doing, you know, it's all these questions are, are, are kind of um, demanding while you're in a, you, while you're in a space, I have, is this one, oh, no. um, I have uh, toyed around with the idea of having, um, I don't know if there's an image of it here, but there's um, a work uh, that I've made that's just a Marshall amplifier with all the, all the knobs turned up full, so you hear, the, you hear white noise. Um, and when you put it next to a waterfall or the ocean, it, it sounds like the ocean mm. or the waterfall, right? So I have toyed around with the, uh, the idea of having one of these amps next to the, next to the work, but I think this, the silence in this, um, uh, uh, in this piece probably works to its advantage as opposed mm. to... Um, I mean, the juxtaposition of two works might be interesting, but um, uh, in this instance, the silence is more... Particularly thinking about... Um, I'm a big fan of, a fan of Rumi actually, and his a lot of his poems end with some reference to silence mm. and the lack uh, thereof. Mm. And and it just um, made me think about how fascinated you are with waves, be it actual waves of uh, seascape or big electromagnetic waves or sound waves or music waves. But again, in all these things, the repetition is something that um, brings out questions of meditation of uh, ritual so I was wondering what is the role of ritual in your work and can the, can can rituals and spirituality engage in a fruitful conversation with technology mm. um, especially through art yeah that's a yeah good question to come to actually because like as you say like the the preoccup the preoccupation with waves is the same as this uh, for me is the same as electricity being my medium, there's a reason why that is the, the same thing. I mean, electric, electricity is on the electromagnetic spectrum, right, mm -hmm. like light. And then there's sound waves that are separate to that. Um, so, you know, that's from my actual, that last image was from my BA show uh, in 2001, and it was uh, like sound sculptures, and you saw waves already in there, right? Um, so, yeah, so all these you know, waves represent the whole of reality for me in some ways. If you think about uh, quantum mechanics, for instance, you know, the whole of reality can be sort of understood as a wave function uh, in terms of, you know, which I won't go into because I'm not a physicist and it's probably uh, a bit boring uh, for, the, for this purpose. But um, so, and there's something deeply spiritual about that, you know, the, the idea of cyclical things and things that, up and down, whether it's whether it's ecology, you know, or just, it's just the environment, you know, uh, or um, the way uh, celestial objects move around us, the way the seasons work, everything is everything is mm. like kind of a wave. Whether um, uh, when we when we think about it, um, and then moreover, there's there's uh, there's how our brain functions, the neural oscillations, and and how. Um, those and how we all have varying frequencies, you know, uh, just just to sort of um, exist or engage with what we call reality. Um, uh, so, yeah, I guess I guess this is a preoccupation, but this is the core of like uh, working because it's something that you know it's a constant question posing constant questions mm. and the deeper i go the more questions sort of evolve um uh, or, or or need to be addressed mm. so it's like the it's the, like it's like a you know sort of driving force for mm. for my practice i wanted to also turn our attention to uh, your 2022 exhibition at the listen gallery for a dyson sphere which i think is a key moment in your practice where the ecosystem of works you presented there dealt with all of these interrelationships of art, technology, ecology, science, but also um, historical and cultural tropes of um, energy and power. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? So, which I believe we have seen a few images yeah. of and how you, uh, you researched um, for it. Yeah, so um, the Dyson sphere, I, I don't know how that came about. I guess it's, well, it starts with uh, Freeman Dyson uh, actually, it starts with uh, what's his name? Who's the novelist? He he he. Uh, this no English novelist that uh, brought this idea of this megastructure 
uh, that an alien civilization is built, right? And then the physicist Freeman Dyson, uh, who's one of the founders of SETI, um, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, um, proposed this, wrote a paper about if you're looking for if you're looking for alien life out in the cosmos, you might want to look at uh, stars that have suddenly had redshift, or you know they've been covered up basically, mm -hmm. and the reason being that any advanced civilization would build a megastructure around this star um, and um, harness uh, or exploit as much energy they can from it in order to I don't know become intergalactic as a species or whatever, right? So um, so that um, so that inspired me to like think about this as a as a as a proposition, as technologists did. You know, lots of people took on this idea and thought that maybe that's a good idea for us, but us to you know work towards, you know, maybe when we have fucked up this planet, we can go and mine Mercury and and <laughs> and get all the you know take apart Mercury and build this mega structure around the sun so we can go and hang out on. I don't know Uranus or something, and uh, uh, so this whole idea of um, you know this 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 thing is it's actually exploitative, you know, mm. and the question arose um, about um, whether we uh, are a, whether we are a, uh, whether our, us as a species are symbiotic with nature and the rest of and the rest of the universe, or whether we're just like a parasite uh, and and exploitative and sort of trying to figure this out through making this work and you know coming you know clearly with with a, the technology we have there's you can't you can't generate enough power from mediating energy from the sun all this all the all the energy you know 99.99 whatever percent of energy on this planet the source is the sun right um and actually unmediated energy is the most efficient form of energy mm -hmm. so as soon as you start mediating is when things become uh, inefficient um, or inefficient um, and um, so uh, yeah it's kind of really thinking about that and, and, and yeah sort of thinking about it in a sort of more critical and, and uh, open-ended way I yes. guess. I think that it's really important again to draw an analogy between what we all think about when we think about the future. If like we project ourselves into the future for 50 years in terms of ecology, like you know, images of apocalypse come in our minds. In terms of technology, perhaps the same, you know, perhaps technology has taken over the human species in a way that is not controlled. So I just wanted to ask you. Um, through your work and, for example, with the Dyson Sphere exhibition and series of works where, you know, the, you engage with this idea of harnessing energy uh, from the stars, which is, again, in this context, we always think that this is a strategy reserved for the few, you know, like when we think about the future, it's always um, also fantasies of escape from the planet, um, rendering us an extractivist species in that sense. So. I'm just wondering if you can say about the role of artists and art um, in this conversation and how um, it can act as a catalyst to go deeper um, mm. in these questions. Yeah, I think uh, for me through, through art making that process, you inevitably go deeper in asking these questions and, and coming to sort of solutions, because it's a bit like, Art making is a bit like experimentation, you know, what scientists do, but without a goal. It's like a not a goal-oriented form of experimentation. And, um, well, for me, uh, I think, for me it's more successful when it's not goal-oriented. Or there might be a goal, but that changes through the process of making, which makes it non. Uh, and, um, and I guess there's just so much to learn in terms of... Uh, in terms of that process, but I don't think artists alone can uh, make concrete um, uh, developments. I think you know, so collaboration is really important in that sense, and 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 widening the scope of what art is and who engages with art and how artists work with other people, like scientists or mm. even architects and musicians and so on. You know. Um, uh, within the within the creative realms, and then ex extend out to uh, you know perhaps neuroscientists and 
uh, ecologists and mm. so many other uh, people that um, have access to certain types of knowledge. Because I think for me, it's this an epistemological thing, thing about knowledge that it's it's very human driven. So for me, knowledge uh, is uh, expands with population mm. somehow. So the more people there are, the more knowledge we have, and the more we can see out to the universe, the more we can see into the small and um and as population comes down and this question of you know what's going to be you know if we if we fuck up our planet and it may we make it inhabitable for ourselves there will still be the planet and there might be other species and whether or not that's a technological species or not you know it doesn't matter that there, there, there will be something you know um and that sort of carries on. And so what's the role that we play in that is, is, is still sort of uh, important. You know, nothing, nothing happens quickly. It's mm. not like the Armageddon is like a two week process. Um, uh, you know, we might be in the middle of it, you know. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a very um, vital thing to kind of continue to um, develop a vocabulary around uh, what uh, what, wh where we, who we are, and where we're going, mm. and then to sort of ha somehow make that a collective thing as opposed to an individual thing. No, absolutely, and I think that um, artists have a crucial role to play in these, con making these connections and facilitating these conversations if only they are allowed and we allow mm. them. And I wanted to turn, uh, as we're coming slowly to a, c a conclusion, opening up to the floor, um, to your work, Stone Circle, um, at Ballroom, Texas which refers to prehistoric monuments such as Stonehenge and Nine Ladies with, uh, with standing, stones, um, erected by, uh, standing stones erected by humans and used for mysterious practices of communion with the earth. So in this work, I'm fascinated by the connections that you drew between earth, between rituals, between monuments and space, its activation every full moon, um, but also how it impacted the local community uh, through the use of solar power uh, that is inside it. Can you tell us a little bit more about this work? Yeah, that was really interesting because when I was visiting Marfa to work on that project, um, to get there, you you know, there's a three-hour drive unless unless you you know unless you've got access to a private jet and you can sort of land in the airstrip there, which I didn't. Um, uh, you, there you have to drive for several hours, and on that drive I never saw any solar panels you know you're in the desert where all you can see is sun and there was no nothing solar no, well no other forms obviously it's oil country right mm. Texas so um, it's not the kind of thing that they push and um, when we did the project and we got uh, luckily sponsored by a solar company out of Austin um, there was such a kind of you know the, the community there were like wow you can you know you can generate electricity just like that so that company set up shop in Marfa and um, started trading and you know um, so that was kind of a really nice thing that came out of that project mm -hmm. without you know without having to you know which, without having to engineer it and I think that's when um, art can be really powerful that you know my goal was to create a you know this stone circle inspired by yeah, Neolithic monuments like you're saying but it's also like an experiment right so um, I often I often think sites like Stonehenge, for instance, are scientific s experiments of their time rather than these places of ritual. They become places of ritual. I've been avoiding this question of ritual. Haven't I? Um, <laughs> the uh, play, the uh, thing uh, becomes a site of ritual, but that's afterwards because you know it, it's quite plausible that there was because there was the heel stone, the Stonehenge site, for instance. There was a heel stone there. And if you stand at a certain point away from the heel stone, well, let's say, let's say um, east of it, you know that the sun is going to set right behind mm. it. So then you might go, oh, well, I'm going to put a stone here on the summer solstice, right? And then you look, the sun always sets there on the summer solstice. And then you might go over there and say, oh, well, that's on the, on the, on the equinox. That's mm. where the sun is at this point, you know. And you keep doing that over... I don't know how they got those rocks there, but anyway, you keep doing that, and and uh, you get a stone circle, right? That's what emerges, um, and then the rituals come in, and and that's I think this is the thing with ritual. In the end, it's it's a very um, individual thing. Rituals are individual. You know, you can 
engage, you can decide that you want to um, join some kind of ritual. But it's, it's so sort of shrouded in belief as opposed to truth, mm. right? And, and, and you have, and you know, like a, the ritual of, I don't know, making a cup of tea in the morning or, uh, or doing yoga or whatever, you know, whatever these rituals are, they're, they're, they're always an individual thing. And, and for me, it's more interesting that rituals emerge that are meaningful as opposed to um, uh, they're, emer they're an emergent thing as opposed to a prescribed thing? Um, I think it's important to um, highlight if, um, how this project at, um, how this project at uh, Texas um, engaged with the local community mm -hmm. and how open they were to having discussions with you and what perhaps you learned from actively engaging with the local community through questions of technology, ecology, mm -hmm. power. Yeah, I mean, you know, Mexico is a really strange, I mean, what well, Mexico, sorry, that, that yeah. part of Texas or Texas itself is a very strange place. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, a lot, let's say half of the community in Marfa mm. refer to it as occupied Mexico, mm. right? And uh, other people refer to it still as Mexico. And then, then there's, oh, it's also, you know, West Texas, right? Mm. Um, and that, um, that um, is a strange dynamic and in, in itself. And those stones actually came from Monterey. So they came over the border and the, in the process of getting them there, they got stuck at the border because people, the, the border control were like, what is this? Why, you know, how much are you selling this for? How many worktops are you going to make from these stones? And so on and so forth. Um, and it was interesting, the community that really was present during the unveiling of the stone circle uh, was a very indigenous community, actually. And there was this one woman that came to me and said, um, this keeps chopping, um, and told me, uh, she literally grabbed me and said, she, she asked me, do you know what this land was used for? And I said, no, I don't know. She said, time travel. And I was like, oh. I was like, well, you know, and at one point, you know, at, at some part of me was thinking this woman's crazy, but the other part of me was thinking, I want to know more. Where are you, you know, getting? and there wasn't enough time to uh, speak to her about it. And, and also that uh, area is also very uh, much where uh, peyote is indigenously mm. from. So, um, and those ritual, you know, uh, I mean, there's lots of different uh, communities that work with peyote now, and it's been co-opted by all kinds of, uh, you know, there's a sort of syncretic religions now that have sort of co-opted uh, peyote religion, uh, peyote use for, for uh, because of various political uh, reasons. Um, but uh, I think it's a very important part of that place. Um, and I, w I was more interested in learning about those uh, sort of more ancient and, and historic um, types of practices and, and, uh, and rituals than the, than the present day ones. Because the present day ones will happen, you know. Because mm. the thing is, on one side, there's, it, it's, 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 um, the stone circle is predominantly for um, you know people that know about contemporary art, but then there's a whole other side of it that's just the local community that are there, and you know other things are sort of building and emerging, and that will take years. You know, hopefully it will stay there for years, mm. and and those things uh, will uh, will emerge. But again, it's not something that uh, necessarily needs to be uh, prescribed. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to uh, end with a question that um, it's beneficial for me as a curator, but I think for the audience as well. Um, and it's the question where I ask you, where is your current thinking? Is there something that you are working on right now? Is, are there ideas that are carrying your work um, into the future? Yeah, I think uh, the ideas, I mean, I mean, most of them I've spoken about now, but I think the thing that's really uh, seems most urgent for me at the moment is this idea of this sort of relationship between truth and belief and, and how uh, belief is not really something that we choose. We just either do or don't believe something or in something. 
uh, and, and truth itself is something that's irrelevant and somehow unaccessible um, for um, <laughs> someone's, <laughs> someone's calling the camera. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. um, yeah and 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 certainly with you know all the horrific things that are happening in the world you know trying to figure out how uh to uh yeah kind of bring uh, build bridges and, and 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 trying to understand how um how you know sitting on fences you know has often been this Thing is described as a negative thing to do but actually if you're on the fence and building gates that's kind of a, probably a more essential place to be right now mm. than and rather than thinking about art as political criticism thinking about art as diplomacy um, is uh, are probably like urgent things but you know these ideas where how they uh, end up in um, practice is, is, is kind of a long and slow process and I, I mean I'm working on a sort of a quasi-opera, I, I don't want to call it an opera because it's more like a Gesundkunstwerk that crit that's a critique of opera and its conventions, but um, but it's a very collective effort and, and, and trying to dilute those distinctions between uh, what is perhaps choreography, what is set, what is music, what is, um, uh, I don't know, like audience, you know, all mm. those things come into question and, and, and uh, yeah. An ecology of things. An ecology of things, exactly. That's nice. <laughs> thank you very much, Harun. This thank was you. great. Thank you all for being here and thank you, Diverse, for having us. Thank you. Thank you.